Hello everyone, JD here. This presentation is entitled Plantation Life in the 18th Century. We've got three subtopics, first of which is technology and the environment, secondly, slaves' lives, and finally, free whites and free blacks. Let's get rolling. Technology and the environment. Sugar production had both an agricultural and an industrial character. Growing and harvesting sugarcane required tools like spades, hoes, and machetes. Once cut, a more complex and expensive process needed to produce the sugar. This will begin. All right, so there's three points I want to make here, or at least three steps. Slaves rushed the cane to mills where it was crushed and the juices extracted. Secondly, lead-lined wooden troughs carried the cane juice to copper kettles, and the excess waters there uh, then boiled off, leaving the thick syrup. And finally, it's placed in a conical clay mold. The syrup is then turned into crystallized sugar as it dried, right? Smaller refiners relied on crushing mills powered by animals or even slave labor, whereas the larger plantations where they have mills, they're going to be the more profitable enterprises. They utilized more efficient mills that relied on wind or water power. And so they operate at a lower cost and they can make more money. In other words, their profits are higher. And this is gonna drive some of the smaller farmers or smaller plantation owners out of business. Remember, when you go into business, the goal is to make money. So you're going to try to be as efficient in your operation as possible. So investors sought to utilize the costly crushing and refining of machinery intensively. Three points I want to make here. West Indian plantations expanded from the average of around 100 acres in the 17th century to twice the size in the 18th century. In 1774, Jamaica's 680 sugar plantations average 441 acres, with the largest one being uh, 2,000 acres, which is an incredibly large plantation. Now, Jamaica is going to be so specialized in the production of sugar that they actually had to import some of their food because people wanted, I mean, sugar is so profitable and there's a demand for it in places like Europe. So the land is being so intensively used that they're going to have to find food sources for people to sustain themselves other places, right? So they're going to have to import it. Uh, the next point I want to make, oh, and I want to say this too, Jamaica is going to be controlled by England. All right, so then in, let's see here, we have St. Domingue, which is going to be a French colony, which is currently Haiti, had a comparable number of plantations of smaller average size, but higher productivity. They had a more diverse economy. Some planters raised provisions for local consumption. We say provisions, we're talking about food, as well as crops such as coffee and cacao, which is used for making cocoa or cocoa butter. All right, sugar agriculture had a mixed environmental record. So there is a positive part of this we have to mention. Some practices were not destructive. Planters uh, powered their mills by animals would actually fertilized the fields using manure from the livestock. However, you know, the term we would use today is deforestation. Everywhere in the Caribbean, forests were cleared to plant sugar or other export crops, which means you got to cut them all down. That does have a detrimental effect. Repeated cultivation of single crop removed more nutrients from the soil than animal fertilizer and fallow periods could restore. So it's also, think about this, every time you, you plant a crop, it's going to be the, the whatever plant that you, you, you have there is going to be taking nutrients out of the soil. The more frequently you do it, the more the soil becomes depleted. And after a while, the soil, it doesn't, the, the crop yields are going to suffer as a result. So this is also a, a, a negative impact. Uh, planters found it more profitable to clear new lands when yields declined. So that means cutting down more trees in some cases. I mean, you have to clear it. Whatever foliage is there, you have to clear it. All right. The land is eventually going to be exhausted. So in some cases, they're going to move to new islands. The English who settled Jamaica had been planters in Barbados prior, right? Introduction of non-native animals and cultivated plants transformed the environment. The Spanish brought cattle, pigs, and horses, which are going to multiply rapidly. Uh, bananas and plantains were introduced from the um, Canary Islands. Those are going to become staples, which people eat. Sugar and rice, along with tobacco, becomes the basis of plantation in the economy. And other crops arrived with slaves from Africa. We have okra, black-eyed peas, yams, grains such as millet and sorghum, and mangoes. So we even have certain items coming from Africa. 
And think about this for a second. When you forcibly remove people from one place to the next, it's inevitable that they're going to bring their culture with them, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. But also, you know, there's going to be food items that are going to be transported. All right. Most tragic and dramatic transformation of the West Indies is going to be demographic. Disease and abuse nearly eliminated the indigenous peoples of the large islands within 50 years of Columbus's voyage. Remember, Columbus made four trips. We call it the New World. It's not really a new world. People already live there. Okay. And what's going to happen in the wake of Columbus's voyages is going to be very tragic for the people who lived in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, it's eventually going to be this, the islands will be repeopled with thousands of free Europeans and millions of captive Africans. All right. The second item in our list here, slaves lives. Let's talk a bit about this. West Indian plantation colonies were the world's most polarized societies in the 18th century. Most islands, 90% or more of the inhabitants were slaves, believe it or not. 90%, so nine out of 10 people are going to be slaves. They're the, they're the ones who be brought there to be doing all this work, and they're not going to be brought there by choice. These are people who are forcefully removed from the African continent. The power resided in the plant, what's called a plantocracy. In other words, the planter class. This is an elite group of people of European descent. Um, there's a small number of rich plantation owners. Between the slaves and their masters was a small middle group of estate managers, government officials, artisans, and small farmers who were nearly all white. However, there were some free blacks who owned property and even entered commerce, which means they were per participating in the business community, for lack of a better way of putting it. So there are some free blacks. Um, profitability of the Caribbean plantation depended on extracting as much work as possible from slaves. Plantations achieved exceptional productivity through the threat and use, not just the threat, but the, also the use of force. Slaves worked long hours in difficult conditions throughout the year. But when cane harvest and milling was in full swing, uh, work days might stretch to 18 hours. A work day could be 18 hours in length or maybe even more, right? A Jamaican plantation, 80% of the slaves were actively engaged in productive tasks. So four out of five. About 70% of the able-bodied slaves worked in the fields. They organized, they were organized in labor gangs. We have the great gang, which is the strongest slaves did the heaviest work, like breaking up the soil. We had a second gang of young people, older people, or elderly people, and the less fit slaves did lighter work. And then thirdly, we have the grass gang. Children under the supervision of an elder slave were responsible for weeding or, or other um, simple work such as collecting grass for animals okay all right women except when pregnant or briefly after giving birth were subjected to the same brutal labor regime as men um, the slave trade imported twice as many males as females so men are going to outnumber women on nearly every caribbean plantation little over half of the adult uh half of the adult males did non-gang work. Some of them were skilled craftsmen. Um, the most important was the artisan slave, or the most important artisan slave, I should say, is the head boiler who oversaw the delicate process of reducing the cane sap to crystallized sugar and molasses. So the most important artisan slave is going to be the head boiler. Planters rewarded skilled slaves with better quality of food and clothing or with time off. But most field slaves were compelled to work without respite by fear of the lash. Slave gangs were led by a privileged male slave, who is known as the driver. That's the term. And that person's responsibility is to ensure the gang completed its work. So people will end up toiling. By people, I mean the slaves will end up toiling in the fields from sunup to sunset. Planters reserved the most brutal punishments for openly rebellious slaves who refused to work disobeyed orders or tried to escape. In some cases, people were flogged or they were even mutilated. I mean, when I was reading about this, some people even had their ears cut off. That's an example of a mutilation. Cut someone's ear off, right, as a form of punishment. Slaves did not work on Sundays. That's when they had time to farm their own grounds, to supplement their meager food rations, maintain the dwellings that they lived in, and chores, because they also had their other responsibilities like having to 
um, my list here, I have here washing and mending of clothes as an example. They had very little time for relaxation or recreation. They might sing in the fields. However, the singing is just a way to distract themselves from the fatigue and the monotony of the work itself. People weren't singing because they were happy. They were singing because they had to distract themselves. They had to find a way to, I mean, something positive they could do after being forced to do this incredibly excruciatingly um, arduous manual labor. Okay. So I want to be very specific here and want to emphasize singing is not about, is not a way of, is not a reflection of people being happy. Singing is a way of, you know, it's a means that people use to distract themselves. There's no time for schooling, nor were masters willing to educate slaves beyond manual skills useful to the plantation. And you think about it, if you, if, if a person should say would own a plantation, you don't want to formally educate people because think about it, you have these, you're using the slaves as your source of labor. Any time you spend educating people is time that they're not doing any work. And also the more educated people are, the greater the likelihood that people have a better understanding of their condition and that they could find ways to resist. So you're not going to want to educate people. At least that would be the mindset of the people who own these uh, plantations. I'm not suggesting I agree with it when I say what I just said. I'm saying that that would be the mindset of the people who own the plantations themselves, right? And so you're losing productivity if you educate people, but also you're potentially creating someone who's more rebellious because the more educated, you think about this, knowledge is power and knowledge can be a weapon, which means the more people know, the more they can resist. And so a plantation owner isn't going to want to do that. And like I said, I'm not condoning it. I'm not suggesting that it's okay. In no way, shape, or form is enslaving of any human being for any reason acceptable. Right? Don't want to be misunderstood here as I explain this. Okay. All right. Um, we're moving on. We have Poor nutrition and overwork led to the lower fertility rates, but high mortality rates for infant slaves also limited population growth. Heavy field work during pregnancies of slave women made it very difficult, or made it difficult to carry a baby to term. It limited the slave mother's ability to ensure child survival. Deaths outnumber births on West Indian plantations. And the greatest killers are going to be some of the diseases as well here. Dysentery, malaria, and yaws. Okay. Combination of high mortality and low fertility led to an ever larger slave trade. Owners had a continually had to continually purchase new slaves to replace those who died. Majority of slaves were African born, and of course these folks are going to have their own religious beliefs, pattern of speech, style of dress and adornment, and music. And this goes back to a point I made earlier. When you remove people from one continent and place them in another location. They're going to bring with them their cultural norms. And that means that their cultural norms are going to take root and wherever it is that they're going to be living. That is important to mention here. Individual slaves often ran away. And that's a form of resistance, running away. And sometimes larger groups rose up in rebellion against their owners or against the institution of slavery. In Jamaica, there were 16 rebellions between 1655 and 1813. So these are people pushing back against their conditions. Right? And remember, when you're a slave, it's not like, you know, if you're working in industry, like in an early factory that you're going to read about, like during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, and yes, people working in those factories didn't necessarily have a lot of options available to them. However, when you're a slave, you have no options. You either work on the plantation or you flee or you engage in some form of rebellion which is an attempt to to free yourself from your existing condition right so slaves don't have a choice slaves are not um, viewed as human beings they're perceived as property right and they are not respected and they you know this this modern conception of what we talk about we think about like a natural right this did not exist nor was it extended to slaves that's why when you think of them, they're, they're treated as property and they could be mistreated and sold off and so forth, sold off to other people. So it's important to, to acknowledge the state to which these folks are in. They're 
relegated to the status of property, which means you do not have any rights and you have very few privileges, if any at all. And you're subject to however it is your master decides to treat you. Meaning that you could be mistreated. And that goes back to the issue of, or the example I gave with the flogging and the mutilations, like a form of punishment. Like one person perceives himself above another and thinks that I'm going to punish you and the way I'm going to do this is by actually physically harming you, disfiguring you. That says something about the relationship. That says something about the status of slaves, right? And of course, what we do know about the slave trade is it's racialized. Now, slavery existed in the world prior to what we have seen in the Caribbean and then eventually the continental United States, but or what will become the United States eventually, the colonies and then eventually the United States. But this is different in that it's racialized. Okay, European planners tried to curtail African traditions, um, required slaves to learn the colonial language, and discouraged the use of African languages by deliberately mixing slaves from different parts of Africa. Because what people have to remember is something that's important here too is, Africa is a massive continent, and we have different people from different places, which means different people have different cultures, and language is an element of culture. So if you combine different people from different places, then they don't have an effective way to communicate, and then you force English upon them. That's what the plantation owners are going to do in this situation. That's a way of stripping people of their culture. In French and Portuguese colonies, uh, slaves were encouraged to adopt Catholic practices, though African de deities, beliefs, and practices survived. Because people typically resist. That's what they do. I mean, you're going to see this too when Europeans move to the United States and they try to impose, when there's exploration and eventually the settlements, they're trying to impose their values, their faith, and people typically push back. Like when with indigenous people, like the Europeans try to impose their faith and their way of life on, and other parts of their way of life on indigenous people, and those folks are going to resist. It's very, this is very common in the human condition. All right, third subtopic free whites and free blacks the lives of free men and women were very different from the lives of slaves on um, the french colony of uh, saint domingo we have three points we'll make here wealthy owners of large sugar plantations are mostly french nationals who dominated the economy and society of the island because remember, this is currently what's known as Haiti, um, and it's a French, originally French colony. The less well-off Europeans served as colonial officials, retail merchants, or small-scale agriculturalists. Um, there were almost as many free blacks, and many of these people are going to be um, multiracial, as whites in St. Domingue. Right here, the other point I want to make is many free blacks own property and a surprising number also own slaves, believe it or not. That's something that doesn't get an awful lot of attention, but needs to be mentioned here. The authors of the book I wrote this outline from mention. Right, plantation elite was even more powerful in the British colonies. Sugar exports in Jamaica were over 80% of what they were exporting to the to other parts of the world, uh, production crowded out small cultivators, uh, translated wealth into political power and social prestige. Of course, that would naturally follow. And there's this is also fascinating. All right, they put their plantation under the direct direction of local managers while they returned to Britain. Between 1730 and 1775, 70 absentee planters secured election in the British Parliament. And we, when we use the term absentee planter, what this means is the person owned the property but they were actually living back in Europe. They owned it and it was their business to operate, but they had people who were on site locally and those people on site locally were handling the day-to-day -day operations. Whereas the owner, the absentee planter was living in Europe. And 70 of these folks actually served in the British parliament, right? So they're actually in office, okay? Also here I want to point out, the planters who continued to reside in the West Indies exercised political power, um, i.e. their control over 
They had control over colonial assemblies. And an assembly is just like a legislative body. Right? It's possible for the owner to grant freedom to an individual slave or group of slaves. The term for this is manumission. All right. It's more common in Brazil and Spanish and French colonies than the English colonies. Manumission, that is. All right. Some owners in the Caribbean freed slave women with whom they had sexual relationship or freed their children born to the slave mothers. So we're going to have folks having those kinds of relationships. And I've often wondered about this. If a person is a slave, how does a person actually consent to being in that relationship? Because of the power differential. I've, been, I've, I've often, or I should say, I've long wondered about this when I think about slavery in the United States. Think about that for a second. So if a planter, someone who actually owns this property, and they're operating it, they live on site, and they have an, a, a, an affair with a, a slave, and usually it's the male owner and then the, the, the woman who is a slave, right? So they have a relationship. Can that, that woman actually consent to being in that relationship, given their power differential? And essentially, she's forced to be in it, considering the system of labor. And then the system of labor is part of a broader social order. So it's just not, it's an issue to think about here. Largest group of freed slaves across the Americas had accumulated savings and then purchased their own freedom from their masters. So we have people who are actually making some kind of money and then they're buying their own freedom. And the last item I want to mention here is escaped slaves constituted another part of the free black population. There were communities that developed, there were runaways. Uh, the term for this is a maroon. Were numerous in Jamaica, in Hispaniola, as well as the Guyanas. Okay, so we have maroons, people who actually are successfully escaped slavery and then they found their own community. So that's where I'm going to end with this presentation. Thank you for listening. And if, please look at the description below for other um, resources that I found on this topic. What I want to tell you is the image that's in the background of the screen, that image is a French plantation in 1762, I believe. And there's a really great web page that I found called Slavery Images. And it's put together, it's been assembled by a historian at the University of Colorado, Boulder. And so I'm going to put that information down below and you can go and take a look at some of the images, the pictures, to get a better sense about the institution of slavery. I want to thank you so much for listening. Peace.